Let's talk about light. Light has four properties that we focus on in growing greenhouse crops. There's light quantity, which refers to the intensity of the light. There's light quality, which is the wavelength of the light. Duration, or the total amount of light received. And photo period, which refers to the specific day length. And all four of these are specifically important in greenhouse crops. And I'm going to break them out. A couple things that you need to remember about light. Light is absorbed. And when that light is absorbed, it's either uh, converted to heat energy or chemical energy. And of course, the plant converts it to chemical energy because it's using it for manufacturing photosynthates. That energy that's absorbed and converted to heat is re-radiated as long wave energy in the infrared region. Light that's transmitted passes through an object, basically unaffected, and then there's light that's reflected or scattered. All the light that our eyes perceived, our light that our eyes perceive, excuse me, is reflected. Okay? So it bounces around. Now this is the energy spectrum going from 10 to the minus 14 uh, meters to 10 to the 8 meters or uh, nanometers, the visible spectrum is this little bitty window in amongst the whole thing, starting at gamma rays, which just zip through the Earth, and X-rays, um, ultraviolet rays, which we've already talked about, uh, ultraviolet, including um, the, for the sterilization levels, UV, A, B, and C, infrared, radar, shortwave radio, TV, and all the way up to AC circuits and stuff. But this wavelength that we're looking at is from, specifically, the visible spectrum is around 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, some people go down to, let's say, um, 380, if you've got really sharp eyes, up to about 730, depending on species and stuff like that. Now, there's a couple of ways that we measure light. The most common way that people measure light is using a photometer. Now, a photometer specifically measures wavelength in foot candles, lumens, or lux. Those are the different units that foot candles are measured in. A photometer measures light in the visual human acuity spectrum. A photometer's peak sensitivity is in the middle, which is green. Who's colorblind? Anybody? Anybody colorblind? Sure. You're not sure? Oh, right on. Yeah. You would know. You would have lots of tickets from running red lights because you would have trouble determining red and green, red, green, colorblind. Um, so the peak sensitivity of a photometer is, is in the green. Pretty much this is not very useful for biology and in, uh, plant biology in that we're more worried about what we use, the 400 to 700 nanometer range, not the peak. So we use what's called a quantum sensor. Now, quantum sensor is a different piece of technology than a photometer. Um, Photometers are very common in cameras. Well, all cameras have them. Even your iPad, iPhone, and your um, Androids have a photometric or a photometer sensor in that phone. Uh, there's all kinds of apps that you can buy. However, in uh, plant biology, we use what's called a quantum sensor, and it's a quantum flux meter. And what it measures is what we call photosynthetic active radiation where we're looking at the activity between 400 and 700 nanometers, this is the use, the, the range that's used by plants for photosynthesis. And uh, one of the old terms that we used was a micro Einstein per meter squared per second. And a photon unit of light 
or is often typically now described in as a mole of light, or how many photons in a mole is 6 times 10 to the 23rd, use Avogadro's number. That's a mole of light. That's how many photon units there are. It's not a photon torpedo from Star Trek or anything like that. So I have a, a brand new sensor that I just, just bought. You have a question? Okay, this particular photon, uh, this particular light sensor that I bought, pay a little bit extra for it, has a photon sensor and a quantum sensor on the same unit. Now, ordinarily, I don't buy, I, I focus on the quantum sensor, but I work with enough people that they, we need to know the, the foot candle readings in here. So, for instance, under this light fixture here, I have. 120 foot candles of light. I switch it to the quantum side. I have 26 micromoles per meter squared per second photon units. Okay. Now, as I get into this lecture, this the differences will come a little more clear. Question again. Pass it around. Let's not talk about specific lighting just yet. Okay. So your cameras and your light meters, and uh, if you go to the ORCID websites, um, the ORCID websites have done a really good job of giving you conversion factors where you set your ISO of your digital camera to whatever, I, like ISO 100 or something like that and lock it in and you set it between the f-stop and the uh, shutter speed, it'll give you what the light intensity is in either foot candles, lux, or lumens, but not photosynthetic active radiation because it's not in the wavelength specific for a plant. It's the wavelength specific for the camera, and the camera relates to your eyes. Okay. Now, I had a man in my office earlier this week that was showing me a new device where they can do a fiber optic and they have a, they can go in and program the chip, the light sensing chip that's in a camera and they can program it to the specific, to detect specific wavelengths within half a nanometer. Mm -hmm. a little, just a little firm, yeah. Okay, so with photosynthesis, this is the light spectrum that I'm interested in for photosynthesis. The chlorophyll molecule, chlorophyll A, is um, about 430 nanometers. Chlorophyll B is about uh, 670 nanometers. Those are the peaks of the light. Um, and then our carotenoids also participate in um, photosynthesis in the whole spec spectrum of energy absorption. So don't forget about the carotenoids too. It's not just chlorophyll A and B, the carotenoids. And you'll notice that there's this big gap in green because plants are green because we see them green. Plants do not use green light. Okay? What's that? Plants are green because they reflect, the chlorophyll molecule reflects green radiation, and you see green light. So if you've ever asked to do a uh, science fair, this comes up all the time if you're a science fair judge for a bunch of third graders, and it's a lot of fun. Science judging third graders is probably the most fun you'll ever have, because they are so focused, so scared, so intent that they do an, a wonderful job, and you'll learn something from those third graders. Guaranteed. So nothing is it's only reflection, okay. So it's either, green light is either transmitted or it's reflected, okay. Other devices we use, we use radiometers, and most of this, the um, weather stations use what's called a radiometer or a pyronometer. And this measures the entire energy spectrum, and those units come in in watts or joules. 
and that's energy as a total. And then w um, spectral radiometers, these can be, oftentimes these are scanning spectral radiometers where we can scan a spectrum to see this is something that uh, greenhouse manufacturers, greenhouse film manufacturers use to tell you what the wavelengths, the specific wavelengths are of that particular product. Uh, we're going to play with that in the greenhouse uh, before the end of the semester and some others, so um, I bought it for you to, to play with. So, Most recommendations for plants, however, are always given in foot candles. Why is that? Foot candle meters are cheap. The sensor is inexpensive. The, foot, the, the, the sensor for quantum flux is expensive. They're cheaper. I'm sorry? Why is it called a foot candle? Because the energy of light, one foot a candle light one foot away is one foot candle. That's the standard. So. No, Lux is the metric, or Lux is the meter. So what you just have me down there was meter squared. Right. Now, Lux gets into a whole other area. Range of light intensity anywhere from 12,000 foot candles on a bright summer day to 300 foot candles on a winter day. Most plants will max out in their photosynthetic efficien efficiency at about 3,000 foot candles if that leaf is perpendicular to the light source. You remember the early part of the class we talked about angle of incidence? It's coming back. So this is CO2 exchange. This is how we measure li uh, light efficiency and light intensity. And this is for um, uh, plant, uh, house plants. And I can't remember exactly which species this is for. But um, we have what's called the light compensation point. And what the light compensation point refers to is the light intensity where we have net photosynthetic gain. Below that compensation point, we have respiration and photorespiration, and the plant's actually consuming more energy than it's gaining. We can shift this light compensation point between species. For instance, the light compensation point is lower for a, a shade plant, forest, shor forest floor plant, or something like that, where the light compensation point is higher for plants that are sun plants. You know, we have sun plants and shade plants. Some plants do better in sun or shade. However, I can acclimate that species and shift this light compensation point. One of my favorite things to do is to go into a big bank that's got a brand new shipment of ficus benjamina that have been there about two weeks. And I'll have to walk up when nobody's looking and shake the snot out of it. <laughs> What's going to happen? The leaves are going to fall off. The leaves are going to fall off are the non-acclimated sun leaves. The new leaves that don't fall off are the ones that have been growing since the plant has been there. And their light compensation point has been shifted because they're adapted or acclimated to that condition. So this is a critical thing if you're going to do foliage plant interior scape management is acclimating your plants to that new light intensity. That's the take home message of this graph right here. Do the shape of the leaves change? Do the shape of the leaves change? They can change. Actually what happens is the specific density of the leaf changes. A sun leaf is smaller, denser, has more layers of palisade parenchyma. A shade leaf <coughs> is bigger, wider, and thinner, <coughs> one, maybe two layers of palisade parenchyma. So the shade leaves are typically larger. And you know what? They weigh the same. Same mass, just broader and thinner. Good question. So photosynthesis, a leaf typically pho they, they max out at about 3,000 foot candles, but yet a whole plant won't be saturated until about 10,000 foot candles. Why is that? Leaves, leaves are shaded by other leaves, and also not all the leaves are facing the same way. Okay? Some crop, crops, only 1,000 foot candles, like African violets. Uh, foliage plants, some are burned 
you know, the foliage is actually burned at brighter light. Big old shade leaves not necessarily a bad thing to Big old shade leaves is not necessarily bad, that's right. So when the light gets, it's your goal as a grower to give the right intensity to your plant, decrease the intensity in the summer with shading, increase with the winter with maybe supplemental lighting, decreasing in the middle of the day or towards the end of the day because photosynthesis is, is um, more active in the morning and you can have movable shading to give yourselves a moderate. To maximize photosynthetic active radiation, less shading, less super structure, better glazing, clean, make sure your angle of declination is the same, keep your glazing clean, plant spacing, this is where if you give your plants lots of space you'll grow nice wonderful beautiful full plants but yet if you've used so much of your bench space to produce that nice wonderful full plant you're not getting enough plants per square foot and you're not going to make money so there's a margin where you have to start bringing your plant spacing in tighter and of course it changes with species and seasons <coughs> one of the new areas and there's several reading articles in your uh, on the website on a new it's not a new concept but it's a concept that's being focused on more and more and that's called the daily light integral the daily light integral is the cumulative amount of that photosynthetic light those number of photon units per meter squared per second how much is received per day and it's in it's a molar value and DLI uh, daily light integral affects your root and shoot growth of seedlings, plugs, cuttings, so forth and so forth. Now, I have a video. Welcome to Floracast, the podcast for greenhouse growers. Floracast is brought to you by Greenhouse Grower Magazine in conjunction with the University of New Hampshire, North Carolina State University, Kansas State University, Cornell University, and Purdue University. This week's podcast is from Roberto Lopez of Purdue University. Welcome to today's podcast, where we'll be talking about daily light integral and how it affects your greenhouse crops. In a previous podcast, we have talked about measuring light in the greenhouse. Today, we will review some important concepts and then talk about daily light integral. Plant growth is driven by photosynthesis, which converts water, carbon dioxide, and energy from light into carbohydrates that plants use to build cell walls and organs. However, less than half of the energy from the sun falls within the photosynthetically active range, or PAR, from 400 to 700 nanometers. Increasing energy in the PAR range up to an optimal light intensity maximizes photosynthesis, which increases plant growth and crop quality. This greenhouse operation is reducing the amount of light that the crops on the bench are receiving by hanging too many baskets. The only way to determine if the crop on the bench is receiving enough light in the PAR region is to determine the cumulative amount of light received over time. This cannot be accomplished with instantaneous light measurements. The term daily light integral or DLI describes this cumulative amount of photons of light in the PAR region that an area or location receives during one day as we can see in the figure. Therefore, DLI is the cumulative amount of photosynthetic light received in one square meter or 10.8 square feet each day. We cannot emphasize enough that DLI cannot be determined from an instantaneous reading. DLI is similar to a rain gauge. A rain gauge is used to measure the total amount of rain that was received in a particular area during a 24-hour period. Daily light integral varies due to both external and internal factors within the greenhouse that influence light intensity and duration. They can include the time of the year, the location of the greenhouse or cloud cover, the photo period, greenhouse glazing materials or shading materials, structures and obstructions, hanging baskets, and supplemental lights. These maps compiled at Clemson University show how outdoor daily light integral varies by location and time of the year throughout the United States. 
D to light is expressed in units of moles of light per square meter per day. Values from sunlight outdoors vary from 3 moles during a very cloudy day in the winter to 60 moles on a cloudless day in the summer. In a greenhouse, values seldom exceed 30 moles because of shading from internal factors which can reduce light levels anywhere from 40 to 70 percent. The target minimum DLI inside a greenhouse to produce an acceptable crop is 10 to 12 moles. There are many positive plant responses to higher DLI. For example, plants may have smaller and thicker leaves, more and larger flowers, a reduced time to flower, increased branching and stem diameter, and increased root growth of both plugs and cuttings. The goal of a successful greenhouse operation is to measure, monitor, and record DLI and then to create conditions within the greenhouse in which their crops can efficiently absorb light and use that light for photosynthesis. In the next podcast we will discuss how to measure DLI. Thanks for watching this episode of Floracast. Come back next week for the next edition of the Floriculture Podcast series. So here's some examples of, of the work that, these, that they've been working on, and this is uh, published by uh, Ricardo, who just did the, the video podcast, and Eric Runkel uh, at Michigan State. You can see where all they're doing with these uh, New Guinea impatience plugs, or cuttings, um, where they're l monitoring the, um, after 16 days of, of uh, propagation, DLI, 1.3 moles per day all the way up to 10.8 moles per day and where it's taken more than 30 days of at the DLI of these this rate per day up to here and we're actually using if you were to to, to normalize this over the number of days and just calculate the, the DLI itself they would all be the same so but you can see how the DLI impacts this question how are we going to calculate DLI? I have a DLI meter that we'll use in lab. Okay, and I'll show you some meters to measure DLI. Yes? So is it, what moles is it photons? Photon unit, a, a mole is 6 times 10 to the 23rd photon units of light. So and that's a four accumulation of between 400 and 700. Photons yeah. Per mm -hmm. meter right, photons per meter squared per second. And we're just taking, collecting how many photon units per meter squared per day in this particular sample. And this is that graph uh, put together by uh, Jim Faust at Clemson. And where taking monthly data, you can see how different parts of the country have different um, daily light integrals. It's basically more than anything else based upon your latitude, but is also based upon cloud cover and positioning of the sun and so forth. And again, this is from Jim Faust's data, where a cloudy day in December, you're only getting about three moles per day. On a sunny day, you're getting nine moles per day. Is that consistent across the country? This is uh, fairly consistent across the country. Um, this was probably collected at Clemson, Uni uh, Clemson University, which is in uh, South Carolina. Um, is it consistent across the country? I'm going to say more than likely within a half a mole or two, uh, but it, it, you need to determine it for your own location. And on a cloudy day in June, it's 12 moles per day, and a sunny day, 26 moles per day. I have not done DLI for Fort Collins, but I do know the gro there are growers that have. Are they going to share their numbers? Are they going to share their numbers? Uh, probably not. It's too easy to measure. This is a um, the, the most inexpensive form. This is a Spectrum Technologies uh, meter. Uh, this is um, it, it it's accumulation meter and it tells you how many your daily light integral. Um, this is one that's using a LICOR quantum flux sensor uh, attached to a Priva device. And this is another device called a watchdog 
that's uh, sold and marketed by the same company that markets this one and markets this product. Um, this, pro this product um, with the bag was $530, just to give you an idea how much these things cost. Um, anyway, I, can, I think these are about a 50, 60 bucks, but these are, these are fairly sophisticated light meters. <laughs> okay, so if you can, uh, if your climate control system has a uh, quantum flux meter, you can program it to calculate your daily light integral. It's not a hard. It's not a the, not a hard piece of software to generate. You can, yeah. you can. Well, you can average it. Some people will take the meeting the, the, the measurements every 10 minutes and average and then do that as accumulation. You know, you got it's running for 10 minutes and you're. But what happens during throughout the day is the sun comes up and the sun goes down. The intensity changes. Cloud uh, goes behind clouds and stuff like that. And if you're going to use DLI to program your crop production, it's important that you be pretty accurate. So this is some of the data that they're publishing out of Michigan State and um, Purdue at this particular time. Um, it starts with um, uh, a lot of the um, up the top uh, uh, ferns and uh, phalaenopsis and hyacinths and such as that. And you can see that the yellow is the minimum num daily light integral that you have to have uh, t for a good crop all the way up into red is going to give you a high quality plant. So a lot of this data is being published and like I said Purdue and Michigan State they've been working on this data set probably for about eight years and pushing this pretty hard. Um, this currently is uh, was this particular pro project is some of Jim Faust's work at at um, Clemson, or is he? A, he's either at Clemson or North Carolina. I get those two mixed up. But uh, it's published in the Ball Red Book. So, yes? Those machines, they give you the DLI up time up to? Up to the point where? So, like, the program would say start measuring DLI at 12 midnight. The cheapest one, you, you reset it every day. You, you reset it at the end of the day. Yeah, you have to, yeah, okay. Reducing light intensity, uh, a lot of growers during the heat of the summer months such as that, reducing light intensity is, is important to prevent scalding your plants, getting it too hot. Um, whitewash, uh, um, back in the old days the whitewash that we used was basically a blend of lime, uh, hydrated lime, water, and a couple other things. Uh, the cheapest latex paints you can buy, the real cheap stuff, if you, mis if you dilute it about 1 to 10 water, will typically, if you spray it on your greenhouse roof at uh, the early part or mid, mid to late spring, it'll be pretty much washed off by, uh, weathered off by the middle of fall. So um, that cheap latex paint does have a place, but you can also buy shade compounds that are specifically designed to be easier to wash off. Shade cloth systems, um, fabrics you can customize 20 to 90 percent shade cloth. The aluminized fabrics also serve as heat blankets and we've talked about those early in the semester. Um, shade systems controlled by light sensors can be interior or exterior. They're typically permanent. Um, some people put them outside the greenhouse to prevent energy from coming into the greenhouse. However, those out, one we put outside are typically very difficult to move on a daily basis, whereas the internal cur curtains are easier to move. The aluminized nets uh, or the black woven polys all the way to the mylar products. The mylar products are designed to shade and to do heat retention as well. Next thing I want to cover in this section is supplemental light. And um, supplemental light, this is an area of technology that's changing, I almost believe it's changing daily. I saw a new set of um, LED lamps that are being manufactured by Philips Company out of Poland that are just absolutely awesome. Um, Fluorescent lights, uh, typically what we find in growth chambers and germination chambers, a fluorescent light has about 20% efficiency of converting 
electrical energy into light energy, where does the 80% go? It's heat. Okay. Fluorescent lamps are common. Um, there's different kinds of fluorescent lights. And we have high intensity discharge lamps. Uh, the HIDs um, that are most common for photosynthetic active radiation. When we first started using HID lamps, we used mercury vapor. That was the first. Then we migrated to metal halides. The mercury vapors and metal halides are primarily in the blue ranges. The high pressure sodium is in the yellow and orange range. 13% efficiency in converting electricity to, energy to light, 20 to 25% efficiency. So kind of a, a spectrum of from 400 to, to 900 nanometers, you can see that sunlight intensity at, at the ground level peaks out around uh, 490 and it starts to, to, to tip, dwindle off. An incandescent light bulb is constantly climbing towards longer wavelengths, and that's why it's hot, right? Mostly reds to far reds. You had a question. Okay. The fluorescent fixtures. This is a typical um, flu uh, fl fluorescent fixture. You see a dual peak in this, but fluorescent fixtures. There's multiple types of fluorescent fixtures you can buy. And I, what they're based upon is what we call lamp temperature. When you start looking at the lamp temperature, a high pressure sodium light, now this is a chart that I put together that blends together the temperature of the lamp and where it is on the color spectrum. So high pressure sodium is 220 2200 degrees Kelvin, and it's right in the um, red to orange range. A standard incandescent is 2700 degrees Kelvin. It's right between orange and yellow. Halogen lights, which a lot of people buy halogen lights because that is a high efficiency of converting electrical energy to light energy. And uh, the halogens, about 3000. Warm metal halides, uh, it's, it's a, a term referring to the, wa to the wavelength of light. And notice how I'm going from 1500 to 8000. I've actually got the spectrum flipped, where red is on the left and not on the right. 4000 standard metal halide. And you can see as the temperature goes up, 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 up in the, in the uh, Kelvin temperature chart, we all go all the way to the daylight metal hal halide to 5500. So when you're if you're shopping for fluorescent fixtures at home, one of the things, they're going to offer you three different color temperatures. And if you're trying to shop for bargain lamps and trying to do something like this, and you're wanting to make all your lights in your apartment and stuff like look the same, you need to track the temperature, the published temperatures on that lamp. Because if you get a, a, cool, a cool lamp and a daylight lamp or a warm lamp, you put them on the same table next to each other, it's going to look really bizarre. One of the things that it also does is makes your skin tones look really crazy. You have a question? <coughs> yeah. Uh, so those high, high output fluorescents. Mm hmm Okay. You're talking about SHO lamps? Yeah, the ones that have eight little tiny fluorescent fields. Mm hmm those are typically daylight balanced. And I don't remember the exact color spectrum. What a lot, of a lot of manufacturers do is they'll blend tubes in blend temperatures in there to get multiple spectrums to give a better balance. So why is it, uh, it, it I'm looking at your, your temperatures, but those should be hotter, technically, correct? Mm -hmm. But they're not. They're not. We're measuring the temperature of the filament. So this is an area, if you, why don't you pull up a CIS chart, it'll really confuse you. Okay. So metal halide lamps are strong in the blue spectrum, producing vegetative, strong vegetative growth. High pressure sodium lamps are strong in the red and orange spectrum, giving more fruiting and flowering. 
and you'll talk to the hobby growers of hobby vegetable growers for doing tomatoes and such as that. Tomatoes, really tomatoes. <laughs> Whereas they will do, they'll grow their crop with a blue lamp, then they'll swap out to a yellow orange lamp to, to, to drive the flowering and the. Um, Fluorescent lamps, um, you could have a pretty balanced spectrum, but they have a low lumen output for the amount of, and they're not practical for greenhouses because you have to have these huge ballast. And typically what happens with, with fluorescent lamps is it's generating more shadows than it's generating light. So it's, we try to avoid fluorescence. Uh, low pressure sodiums have a, a pretty narrow color spectrum. We use incandescent lights in the greenhouse mostly for photo period control. Now the ballast on all these lamps, like the HIDs, and the uh, generate a, hot, a lot of him, ter a lot of heat. So, for instance, where we're building our lamp fixtures now, in one one compact unit, we want to mount the light fixture beneath the shade cloth. For instance, in in, in Canada and in northern latitudes, where they use a lot of high pressure sodium, they always mount the lamps beneath the shade cloth, so they pull the shade cloth over the lamp and capture that energy. So. Yes, there's a lot of wasted energy that's not being generated to light, but we're keeping the energy in the greenhouse to heat the greenhouse. You're paying for it. You might as well use it. Uh, here's some um, HID lights in a, in a, in a plug house. Um, these are not particularly my favorite because those, those uh, domes give a lot of um, energy. Fluorescent lights are very common, oftentimes fluorescent light fixtures for African violets. You can run an African violet lamp uh, under fluorescent lights with any, without any other supplemental light 24-7 because they're not photoperiodic and they're just based upon the accumulated number of photon units. So you run your, your um, African violets 24-7. And here's a, a high pressure sodium lamps are on. You note the yellow cast in the photograph? The yellow cast is the light. Question. Uh, you, you said you didn't like to run. Does it matter spread, the light spread? Yeah. Well, the modern greenhouse light fixtures, when they say that this has got to be mounted so many square feet, one of the things they're starting to do is they're, we're doing daily light integral, but we're also doing an ISO, uh, ISO lumen chart or an ISO, lumen, um, ISO, ISO luminosity chart, where what they'll do is they'll map the, uh, ref, uh, the map and design the, the units and we want to have enough overlap of our light so we have uniform light intensity across the bench. The light fixtures, greenhouse light fixtures are designed specifically with uh, reflective prisms on inside, reflective prisms on the inside of the reflector to give the most directed light as possible. So they're pretty, it may look like just a piece of sheet metal but it's very precisely measured for the angle to give the best spread of the light. Well, they have different hoods. The different what? Different hoods, yes. So the difference between putting a, a little day star on the spot this wide mm -hmm. versus a raptor or a magnum hood you know, about this wide. It's based how many square feet it's going to cover. So. Uh, there's a high pressure sodium. Um, this, this is this. <laughs> this is mine. That's a thousand watt. That's a thousand watt. <laughs> that's, a thousand watt that's a thousand watt sodium lamp in my shed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I worry the neighbors. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Well. I can I can read the newspaper in my bedroom from that light, yeah. <laughs> and I'll be starting that this weekend. Yes. Right, back to the hoods. I'm sorry. Uh, the greenhouse hoods they were small. Yes. Why wouldn't you get, Why wouldn't you want a bigger? Well, the the lamp you? is mounted way high, and it's spreading. It's diffusing the light out a long ways. You there. Mm-hmm. Here's another lamp that I've been playing with. When, when you're a horticulturist, people give you things. 
to play with. This is a plasma emission diode. And this generates as much light as that high pressure sodium uh, at only 300 watts versus 1,000 watts. Yeah, it's about $2,500, yes. Uh, I have to give it back one day. So, and this is the, um, uh, the, the spectrum where we've measured the wavelengths with a scanning spectrophotometer for the um, plasma lamp versus high pressure sodium. So you can see the high pressure sodium is very high in certain peaks, but yet the LEP is more spread out. So, and they make just about, that's the plasma, um, the plasma lamp. And you can see it does just about as good production with, the with different species, so. What about the red side? It's a little, it's a little low on that. So light quality effects, uh, <coughs> photosynthesis. <coughs> your pigments. There's another set of pigments called phytochrome. And phytochrome is a very interesting pigment. Uh, it's attached to a uh, protein, and we call it a chromophore. And it absorbs light in two specific wavelengths. Absorbs light in the 660 nanometer range and in the 730 nanometer range. And when we expose it to one light or the other, it has a conformational change of structure. Okay? And this is the, the light sensing switch for photoperiodism. And this is the best way to describe this in that we have two forms of phytochrome. When we take phytochrome, what we call phytochrome red, it absorbs red light, red light at 660 nanometers, and that's the natural state of this chromophore. Okay? When I expose that light to 660 nanometers, it causes a conformational switch, the structure of that chromophore. And it changes the structure of the enzyme that it's sitting on. When we change it to that structure, it's now called phytochrome far red. Now phytochrome far red will absorb far red light and switch back to the red state. So when it's red, it absorbs red light. When it's far red, it absorbs far red light. And it switches back and forth. Now, when it's done this switch, it's an unstable switch. It doesn't like to be in that position. It wants to be put to bed. So over time, it reverts back to the red state on its own. And it's the red, far red balance that controls flowering in photoperiodic plants. A short day plant, plant that blooms when the days are short, like a chrysanthemum or a poinsettia, are vegetative when they have more far red light. Okay? When they bloom in this state. So the leaf is the sensor to this, and it's based upon the time of day. And the holy grail of bot botany is that chemical that's translocated from the leaf to the meristem to tell the meristem to change from a vegetative meristem to a flower meristem. That is the holy grail of horticulture. Okay. So our leaf is our absorbing perceives the, the light change. The darker period, or we call it the nicta period, that's the period of perception. And the longer that darker period is, the more likely it is to bloom. So really, a short day plant is not a short day plant, but a long day, long night plant. Because it's the night period is more important than the day period. You can play with it. 
all day. Three, four Absolutely. So for instance, two plant types, I go to uh, a chrysanthemum, which is a short day plant, and henbane, which is a weed, a long day plant. Four hour photo period, four hours, 20 hour night period. We have blooms with a short day plant, long day plant, no blooms. Eight, day, eight hours, blooms, no blooms. 12, blooms, no blooms. The critical photo period for chrysanthemum is 12 hours, 15 minutes. And you can see now we have no flowers. At 16 hours, the long day plant is now blooming. 20 hours, no flowers, flowers. 24, no flowers, flowers. So what is the adaptive what is the evolution adaptation that's driving this? I'll come back to your question in a minute. Latitude. What's that? Latitude. latitude. So a short day plant, what latitude would you imagine is they're indigenous to? Where? Very far south. Very far south or closer to the equator. You're right. Why is that? Um. This is a photoperiod response, and if it's blooming in, in the fall and into this, well, we bloom plants in the fall, our mums are blooming in the fall, is that a good thing for the adaptation of that plant? It is not, because short day plants like poinsettias and mums, those plants are adapted to latitudes similar to south of Mexico City. And what happens in November, December, and January at these uh, southern latitudes, or the latitudes closer to the equator? It's the rainy season. It's when the plant's blooming to set seed. Long day plants, most of the obligate long day plants are grasses, native to parts of um, the Great Plains, the Northern Great Plains, and areas like that where it's the best time to set seed. They'll set their seed in the summer flower and set seed in the midsummer, and the seed comes off, and it'll go through a germination process, go through the vernalization process, and be ready to go in the next spring. It's all a cycle of life. Your question. Okay, so conceivably, a guy could set up four or six four-hour periods, uh, where during the dark period the root You're getting into carbohydrate balance that I wasn't planning to cover in his class. But so, do you keep it in veg? Yes, you keep it in veg vegetative stage. For instance, this is a chrysanthemum propagation house in uh, southern Florida, and they keep this house vegetative year-round by lighting these lights. And they're running because when they're growing propagation material. They don't want blooms. They want vegetative gro growth. They want it to bloom. Okay, so they'll keep those under long days to keep them vegetative. This is a chrysanthemum, and this is from my front flower bed. What's going on here? This light. picture was taped. Those little LED lights. No, they're not generating enough luminosity to impact everything. Those are what I bought at Big Lots for a buck and a half a piece on sale. Oh, that's the side that's close to your shed. Not bad, <laughs> not bad. Actually, right here is my garage, and we leave the lights on the garage at night on the outside. So there's a light that's on 24 hours a day, and it creates that thing. My <laughs> wife thinks she hates this, I, but I love it because I'm a flower nerd. <laughs> But that's what's going on. So it's that sensitive to light. So we take advantage of this in floriculture, like you're thinking. So again, back to our short day plant and our long day plant. Winter months, the natural photo period in the winter months, we have a 10 hour day, for instance, and a 14 hour night. Short day plant's gonna bloom, a long day plant's not gonna bloom. Well, I want to change that. So I'll light it, and we typically use incandescent light because it's stronger and richer in the red range, and they're cheap to hang, real cheap to hang. 
six hours, all you have to do is give them a six hour on the beginning or the end of the night period and we've interrupted that flowering cycle and maintained the plants in a vegetative state. However, research has shown that if we do what's called a night interrupt that does the same thing as six hours here or six hours here with a two hour interrupt actually has more precision. I don't have an answer for that. Um, and I, have, I haven't found one. But we have more precision in our flowering control to break that up. So what's good about this is because typically to install that much wattage of light in a greenhouse complex to light the whole thing at one time, it's not going to happen. You're going to blow your panel. So what a grower will do that's got lots to do is he'll light one section, one section, one section, one section, one section until they get the cumulative, because this is a cumulative photon units in this wavelength. Okay? Summer months, 16 hours, exactly re 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 reversed, but if I still want to bloom those mums in the summer months when the days are long, I'll pull black cloth and get the same effect. This is why we can grow chrysanthemums 12 months out of the year. Right, though. You, you doing that two hour interrupt? Mm hmm. Because wouldn't you give all the, all the different things that you're doing with your thumb time to go back to the normal state? Exactly. That's the point. I've heard that it can totally send plants into like shock and like turn them hermaphrodites or something. No. Turn into no. No, they're not hermet. No, it won't change this. It won't. This this is typically not going to change the sex of the flowers. No. And one of the things we've been playing with. Um, up until about two years ago, we were looking at the red, far red balances to see what we could do. And I've got some light, I've got some LED lights that actually s are wavelength specific in the um, 630, 630 nanometers. And we were trying to offset stray light because uh, stray light or scatter light at, the at, at our greenhouses at Perk, I have a lot of problem with getting um, uh, the greenhouses dark enough at the night at nighttime to bloom the, the poinsettias efficiently and I get lots of light pollution from the uh, number one the parking lots that they're building and my biggest problem is the sorority house across the street. And if, I, if I was a father of young girls I would want more lights on that parking lot but um, it's an issue for me so stray light, stray light is a big issue with uh, blooming uh, flowering crops. So. Light pollution. The switch on the lawn in the middle of that, it won't shock them? Well, it, it, it interrupts the, the phytochrome de degradation process, yes. <laughs>